I mean, you talk about in your autobiography how um, Marilene went for this um, uh, uh, period where you, you were fly, uh, flying in economy and things like that, and, and you'd, you'd gone right down. But so to sell out the Albert Hall and to sell it out so convincingly, I mean, what did that mean to you as uh, an individual and, and the band? That must have been a momentous moment for you. It was. Um, it was. And it was sort of almost by chance that we ended up playing the, uh, the Royal Albert Hall. It's yeah. two things. One, the, the meeting I had with Stuart Galbraith, where he wanted to discuss doing a gig, you know, doing some gigs with Fish, and Steve Hogarth yeah. banging on about how the Albert Hall was the, the deathbed gig. That's your bucket list gig. And, <laughs> you know, um, whereas for me, I was always, you know, Hammersmith Odeon was the, was the yeah. sign of success because it was where I saw all the bands I saw in my teenage yeah. years. That's a great venue. Um, yeah, um, but the Albert Hall is a different type of venue. Sure. It's more, you know, going to the Royal Albert Hall is more of an occasion, isn't it? And yeah. I think that's it was that that meant that you know instead of getting two or three thousand people, we we sold it out, and it's you know five thousand people. Yeah. Um, but it was a it was like a, a step back up a level. Yeah. Um, it really felt like we had, you know, re arrived. I don't know what the word would be, but yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it did feel like, you know, a, 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 the culmination of a number of years of, of making better albums. Yeah. And um, I think there's a, a, a number of factors came into play. I think the fact that it's a nice venue where you can yeah. take your wife and not have to stand up all night with beer, you know, beer squelching in your feet because of the, yeah. you know, uh, I, I think there's a, you know, to, to put it bluntly, Marillion fans, you know, there's a, a demographic, shall we say, where yeah. people want to have a, a more comfortable night out. They don't want to be standing in a sweaty club, you know. That's right. Some people still do. Some people do, but most people don't. Um, so I think that that helped. I think the fact that we've that the you know streaming Spotify and all that yeah. has raised the band's profile a bit in that area. There's people possibly discovering the band for the first time. You know, we get we get like four million streams a month on Spotify. It's not it's not nothing, you know. Yeah. And, um, and you play you play the sort of music that is uh, designed for a listening audience rather than an audience that just wants to pogo and drink beer, so to speak. So I think they like to yeah. be comfortable. Absolutely, and I think you know, um, but but I think part part of the increase in the interest in the band and and, and ticket sales has, has been brought about by sounds that can't be made in fear. Really, those two albums were both yeah. you know considered above the average for a Marillion album. Um, and I think that helps if people think you're making good music still, you know, coming yeah, from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in your book, actually, you present Steve Hogarth as being rather hesitant uh, about joining. Um, at what point do you think uh, he felt, yep, yeah, this, this was definitely the right move for me? I, th I think he really was hesitant. I think he, but I think his reasons for being hesitant were, were, were valid, you know, one, he didn't, he didn't want to just join a band and be told, oh, you just got to do what Fish did, you know. Oh, we yeah. want you to sing this like Fish or, you know. Um, so I mean, I've, seen, I've seen interviews with uh, Steve Hogarth and he, he visibly gets irritated, I think, when people make comparisons to the, the Fish years as well. So I mean, he must get fed up with being asked that. I think, well, he went, I think naturally, after a few years of being in the band, he was he, he started to feel a bit resentful for the fact that people kept going on about the Fish years and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. So for a number of years, I think he he sort of rejected early Marillion and there was a period where he wasn't like, I don't want to play Kaylee. I don't want to sing Kaylee. You know, it's not my song. And, and um, the, you know, and then there was a, a period where it's like, we've made more albums than we made with Fish. I'm talking like quite quite a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, why are we still doing those old songs? And then, so we, we had a period where we, act, where we consciously decided not to play any old Marillion, not to play Kaylee. Yeah. Um, but then as time goes on, I mean, Steve has been in the band for more than 30 years. Yeah, yeah. We made 15, 16 albums with him yeah. so compared to the four that we made with Fish. Even if Fish had stayed in the band for the, the last 30 years, yeah. he wouldn't be playing much from those first four albums anyway. So, yeah. but he's now much more relaxed about it, you know, yeah. and, and it's like we do the Marillion weekends. It's a great opportunity for us to, to, to go deeper into the catalogue. Indeed. And that's, the times when we tend to you know dig into the old stuff and play you know the old fan favorites whether it's a garden park to your market square heroes or you know um, 
I'm probably in the minority, but uh, I think I'd be quite happy for a set list not to include any fish era stuff. Um, I'm probably in the minority there. I'll probably get howls of abuse in the comments section. Well, I, I think we've got so much to choose from. That's the, you know, that's always been our problem when we do a normal tour. We're yeah. doing two hours of music out of a couple of hundred songs, most of which are quite long. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, naturally. It's it's hard to choose, even amongst the stuff that we recorded with Steve. So, that's, yeah. But anyway, the point is, is that these days I think he's, you know, it's it's sort of ancient history, and he's he's not bothered about. If anything, you know, Pete or Ian or me or Steve might be the ones to say, "Oh, I'm not. I don't want to play that old fish song." You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, he's he's as relaxed about it as the rest of us, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um... According to your biography, you mentioned your interest in a solo work based on Dante's Inferno. I mean, Dante's Inferno is a grisly affair. Um, I'm just wondering whether you would ever consider going back to that and will there be another Marathon album, an album like Marathon? Um, I almost certainly won't go back to Dante's Inferno. I think I was just trying to think of a, a theme to hang a instrumental album or you know although i did ask john helmer to write me some lyrics and he, he wrote me a few short lyrics but they've disappeared somewhere and i've never found them again yeah um, but um yeah, definitely another album um started work on it already uh-huh. um, guy vickers who wrote the lyrics for the the first marathon album has, has already written a couple of really great lyrics that i want to use so um i've been work, you know working with ollie um, a little bit on on that and the singer, um, but it's a case of finding the time to, to you know devote to it. Sure. But um, I am pretty confident that we'll, we'll get at least some of the way um, towards finishing the album this year because we've got the Marillion weekends, yeah, and then second half. Well, we, we're doing some touring at the you know from sort of September, October, November. But you know, there's there's some time in the year for me to to spend a few months here and there on Marathon, which I intend to. Right. Do you think, um, uh, I was just wondering, I don't know if it's uh, information they've put out there yet, but at the next weekend, would you consider playing the new album in its entirety? I think that is the plan. In fact, is it? Is it really? Monday, we're going to start rehearsing it, yes. Um, see, seeing how it is to, to play live. I think it will be a great album to play live. I, I'm really excited about it because, um, you know, Fear was very well received. It's quite a... Um, you feel quite anxious, though, in following an album that was so well received at all, or I do think you just it's be even more well received? I'm, I'm confident. I, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying that just because I'm being big-headed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We've had, we've had some feedback from the record company. I'm jumping up and down about it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, people, people, you know, people might say, "Oh, yeah, the new album's really good," but when you get multiple messages from the same person saying yeah. how great they think it is, you think, yeah. "Okay, I think we've got something here." Well, I've heard um, one track from it, and it's absolutely uh, brilliant. There was a track that was sent out to those who put the pre-order in, and that seems like fabulous. Itself, yeah. I just can't wait to hear the, the whole thing. Well, it's, it's not the best track on the album, that's all I'll say. Um, really? You know, and it's got some... The good thing about it is I think for, for Fear, it's, it's quite, a, quite a slow album in a, in, in a lot of places. It's, it's quite low-key and atmospheric, and, I, you know, I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but... I was conscious of that and, and said, oh, it'd be great if there's a bit more a bit more guitar and a bit more pace, yeah. a bit more up-tempo music in this next one. Um, and there is, you know, um, Be Hard On Yourself has is, is got a bit of pace too, but Reprogram the Gene, Murder Machines, the song that's coming out in, in a, less than a week's time, yeah. you know, just a week's time. Um, they're all, you know, they all move along. Um, and Care, the, the, the closing track, I think will be a, a Meridian classic. So yeah, I'm not, you know, sounds like I'm, I'm sticking my neck out a little bit here, ready to get, you know, <laughs> get shot down in flames. But, but just from the feedback that we've had so far, I think it's going to be... Well, from what nice. I've heard, it sounds absolutely great. I cannot wait to receive it. I don't, I don't know if there's actually a release date on the album yet, or there's... Uh... 4th of March. 4th of March. 4th of March, is that when it's coming out? Oh, yeah. brilliant. Brilliant. Looking forward to that. Um, a few questions from my uh, subscribers. One has said, uh, can you ask Mark what keyboard solo he is most proud of? Um, I don't know about proud of. The one I enjoy playing, I, I like playing the one in this strange engine. I think that's a, that's a 
That's a fun one. Well, he said actually um, that uh, the solo in this strange engine is my personal favourite. So, great. Well, uh, let's, let's let's just stop there then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, going back to the fishies, I love the keyboard solo in Garden Party uh, as well. But there's uh, and some of the keyboard work on Fear is just absolutely fantastic. I think, uh, especially uh, El Dorado, that swell of keyboards that comes in, it's so ominous. It's just absolutely fantastic. Um, go on, sorry. No, I just said thank you. Um, no, it was you know I've I've really. Um, I suppose the, the the equipment I use these days, I, I have like a sort of three or four keyboards around me and I'll when we're jamming I'll, I'll prepare by having a palette of different sounds ready to go and you right. know that's so, so that bit in El Dorado is the the, the the music is sort of inspired by the sound really I get a good best thing I think oh this is a great sound and then yeah it sort of inspires you to come up with something you know to go with the sound so that's yeah that's, that's it's just an, for me it's a great way of working you know well, you said in your biography that you were um, the album Rick Wakeman's Journey to the Center of the Earth was a huge influence on you uh, did I get the right album? Was it that one? Yeah, well, yes, it was. Well, that, that was the one that I heard first and made sort of opened my eyes to this whole the idea of a, you know, an, an album about something, you know, a concept did, album. Did know. it change in any way the way you played, the, the way you thought about uh, your instrument or which, which, what equipment you decided to use? Did it have any influences like that on you? It was, it was the reason I started playing. You uh -huh. know, I, I heard that album and then went, I want to do this. And then I, yeah, you yeah. know, um, so that was my, if you like, you know, I knew nothing about keyboards, you yeah. know, didn't, didn't play, yeah, yeah. Um, but just heard that and went, that's fantastic. I, I'd love to be able to do that. And, and then set about trying to get hold, you know, persuading my mum to buy me an organ and then uh, getting a synthesizer. And, you know, it was a, but that, my, my total focus was on, oh, what does Rick Wakeman use? I want to use that, you know. Right, right. <laughs> Couldn't have been cheap. But, you know his well it wasn't and i didn't really have the money but you know yeah. that's but um you know my my equipment was you know woefully inadequate up until the point i joined marillion and even then it wasn't great until yeah um until we signed a record deal then then we really splashed out some decent keyboards but yeah yeah, yeah. um but um you know those solos that wakeman plays in you know i was just obsessed with those solos really the you know, but as time's gone on, obviously, you know, I, I you know, as I grew up and, and realized, you know, songs and music is not just about solos. You know, you you, you have to, yeah, you have to be sympathetic to to the song. You know, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so, um, yeah. Well, that's uh, all the questions I, I have for you. Actually, um, I want to say uh, the best of luck with this uh, wonderful autobiography that's uh, now available to purchase. Link below. And the new album as well. We're all uh, on tender hooks waiting for that one to come out. So I just certainly look forward to that. I've got my pre-order in anyway, but uh, yeah. well, like the full deluxe yeah. one and everything. And <laughs> well, we're like, come on, we're like, let's get this album. I can't believe it's going to be. I mean, at least it's March and not April, because at some at one point they were talking April, just yeah, because yeah. of the whole vinyl manufacturing and supply chain shortages of cardboard. God knows. Amazon there's been, there's, the there's been the problems with vinyl. They're, they're just because of the um, the interest in vinyl, the renewed interest in vinyl. There, there just aren't enough plants to produce all the vinyl that they need to. So well, at least um, open some more. Yeah, at least Adel have got their own vinyl pressing plant because with with Warners, um, the seasons end and, and holidays in Eden um, uh, reissues that we're doing. They said they need seven months lead time. So from the point we we complete the the remix and the 5.1 they need another seven months to to get the uh, the vinyl manufactured because it's just like, like you say there's so much demand for vinyl and not enough yeah, yeah. Uh, manufacturing capacity so the the new deluxe editions you probably let the cat out of the bag this so the new deluxe edition to come out will be season's end i suppose of all the extras it's actually holidays and evenings first because that one's finished and done it's, it's been you know, okay. that's gone off to you know manufacture season's end will be the the last one from the Warner yeah. stroke EMI catalog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, probably... I mean, after, after the Warner EMI catalog, will there be an interest in perhaps re revisiting some of the albums you did with Castle Communications and places like that, do, doing remixes and remasterings and repackaging? Well, I think so, an album like This Strange Engine could, could certainly benefit from a, a remix. And the thing is that those, those old albums, we, you know, once we, did, once we left the major label, mm -hmm our um let's say our access to 
decent studios and stuff was was very much reduced and yeah. um there's probably a good opportunity to improve the sonic quality i mean we did a remix of radiation back in 2013 which i think was a big improvement it was a great remix as well i think uh that was Mike Hunter. So he's going to look at this strange engine. I mean, we need to see what we've got in terms of tapes and stuff. Yeah. Um, but um, but that's that's the plan. Some point further down the road. Uh, I mean, we've, we've you know we're already in 2022, and I doubt if Season's End will come out before the back end of 22 or early 23. So. Sure. Um, yeah. um, anyway, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. Um, best of luck with your autobiography and. Uh, best of luck with the new album. I don't think you need it. I think it'll do really, really well, but best of luck with that as well. Thank you. And good to talk to you, Barry. And, and thanks for the review. My pleasure. All the best. Bye-bye. Cheers.